Yay. All right. Jeff is uh, 7.30. I'm sure that Chief White will be joining in as soon as he can. If you want to uh, get, uh, get moving, uh, it's time. Very good. Um, 7.30, I'll call this meeting to order. A um, couple of uh, announcements. Uh, let's see, actually first, let's do the roll call of the, uh, of the directors, Tiffany. Sure thing. Uh, oh, roll call? Yep. <laughs> Did I do that before? Yes. Okay, sorry. Um, and you get a chance to do it again. <laughs> How about we'll start with you, Jeff. Are you here? Here. Um, Director Perry. Present. Director Oyserman. Present. Director Shea. I am here. And Director Green. Here. Yay, thanks. Okay, all in attendance. Okay, I'll uh, read the uh, preamble here. This will be a virtual meeting of the Marinwood CSD Board of Directors pursuant to Executive Order N2920 issued by the Governor of the State of California. There will not be a public location for participating in this meeting. Any interested member of the public can participate telephonically or via internet utilizing the web link or dial-in information posted on the agenda. Instructions on how to make public comment during the meeting. At points in the meeting when the chair requests public comment, members of the public participating in the live meeting, either via internet or telephone, shall indicate their desire to speak. If participating via internet, please click the raise hand feature located within the Zoom application screen. If connected via telephone, please dial star nine. Okay. All right, moving on to item B, the agenda. Does anyone on the board have any uh, changes to the order or deletions from the agenda? Not I. Okay, hearing none, we'll adopt the agenda as presented, and thank you. Moving to item C, consent calendar. Does any um, member of the board have questions about either the meeting minutes from May or the May bills paid? No, I asked my questions before. Sivan, you have some questions? No, I said I asked my questions before. I called oh. Eric. Okay, sorry, I couldn't hear you. Bill, you're all set? Yeah, the only thing is, is that I noticed <clears throat> last, last meeting we had the chat, a portion that kept scrolling, and especially at the end, you could read everything that it, people wrote and we don't have that currently um, that would never be entered into the minutes I'm guessing most likely not yeah since okay. I believe the feature's been disabled okay by the way welcome chief no it's all good okay very good and Isabella and Leah no comments no questions no, it just seems like uh, we have refunded a tremendous amount of fees, but that's to be foreseen given the uh, COVID situation. So it is what it is. Understood. Leah? No. Yeah. Nothing. Okay. All right. Um, I'd like to invite uh, the public to comment on the uh, consent calendar if they have anything to say. You do, Jeff. One second. Okay, Stephen, okay. you can unmute. Stephen, okay, go ahead. Yes, hi. Um, can everyone hear me? Yes. Okay, great. So, um, so you know, last meeting, uh, you know, I I don't know why we have minutes when we don't actually uh, have any very little on the minutes uh, to report. I mean. We're, we're paying Tiffany to attend these meetings. She, I, I guess she works full time. I don't know 
why she couldn't do this off a record uh, a recording but um, really I would like a little bit more detail for example uh, in public comments we have coronavirus SIP now in five years is anyone going to know what that means I mean sh she's basically not reporting what is occurring during the me meeting minutes at least we do have this video recording um, and I think uh, in the interest of transparency, especially during this time of virtual meetings, it's imperative that we get accurate uh, reflection of what is occurring in these meetings. That's number one. Number two, on the um, consent calendar, um, I echo what uh, Isabella said. We have a lot of refunds, and it'd be very interesting to see that broken out as a separate category. It's actually quite an astounding amount of refunds that were issued there. And I was wondering um, if we could have a separate line item for, for that particular expense. That's a, that's a question and maybe Eric can respond quickly. Um, I know that I know a lot of these refunds were done individually this past month. Um, it's very, very possible that there'll be a one, one time um, check that goes out um, to active debt next month. So you'll get a better idea of how much is being um, refunded. I'm not aware of any um, summation of what was refunded in the month of May. No, it would be captured within the active net registration software. Refunds at this point are only for programs that we have uh, formally canceled or that were directly requested uh, to be withdrawn from a program. Uh, that said, uh, you know, we definitely do have more coming up. We have, uh, you know, pool memberships and things like that are coming along. But with that will also come other revenue for what the program That's, that's nice, but we'd just like to see how much we're down in dollars. It's really hard to see when you have this all in one big report and uh, one summation figure. You, you really can't get a feel uh, for that large expense. Um, so uh, can we have that done? I mean, that, I think that's kind of a reasonable in this unusual time that we understand, you know, the budget crisis that we're in. Uh, so we can have clarity uh, going into uh, next year's budget? Um, if I may, I believe we um, reconcile all our um, summer program finances at the end of the season cumulatively, so um, that would be kind of part of that exercise because uh, um, it doesn't really matter what we refunded at the end of the day. What matters is um, what the summer program has netted uh, for the district, and we do it annually at the end of the season. That is correct. Well, there's been summer staff because there's we yeah, will not totally. be hiring temporary staff in the quantity that we normally would have if we have a large one. No, that's not. Actually, in terms of um, full-time employees, there have no, been no reductions that I'm aware of. In terms of seasonal employees, um, staff was not hired commensurate with the reduction in the programs that are being offered. So the expenses normally allocated to those people will be missing from our expense reports. Are you, okay, so, okay, so we're gonna be ta talking about budget fiscal year this year. We have to really have clarity on what, where we're at right now. I, with all due respect, figuring out at, at the end of the year doesn't help us before expenses are incurred. Um, 
I believe that we're way, way, you know, with the, uh, the slowdown of business activity, we're way overstaffed. And um, like Novato, San Rafael, the county, everybody is, is considering um, either layoffs or furloughs or, or, or payroll uh, reductions, the temporary p payroll reductions. And I'd like to hear, you know, what the uh, board plans to do about it. I'll, I'll just leave it there for right now. We can just. Can I, can I make a statement about that? Is that okay? All the other districts that you're talking about get sales tax revenue. And so they're getting a huge hit in how much money they're receiving because they are getting less sales tax. We do not get any sales tax. So yes, we are getting a smaller amount of money from our summer camps and other programs, but we also have a smaller amount of staff and expenses that go with those. So from my understanding, from what I've been explained from Eric, and as I walk through the budget with him, we have less expenses and less income coming in. So we don't have a deficit and we also do not have an increase or decrease in funding coming in like other districts because we do not have sales tax. So yes, there is a reduction, but the reduction is in accordance with how much we are also getting in and paying out. So I think that we can probably continue this later, but the big difference between the districts that you talked about in our district is we do not get any sales tax. So property taxes are property taxes are property taxes. Thank you, Savannah. Move on. Let's, uh, okay. Um, thank you, Stephen, for your comments. Do I have a motion to approve the consent calendar as presented? So moved. Second. Uh, I think there was a tie there, but I'll say Bill and Isabella, since you're in the top line here. Thank you. Um, is there any further discussion? No. Hearing none, I'll call the question. All in favor? Oh, uh, where's Tiffany? Uh, no, Tiffany. I'm here. I'm here. Oh, you Sorry. are here. Do you yeah. need to see me? Sorry. Uh, no, but please uh, do the roll call vote. I was eating dinner. Sorry. I didn't think you wanted to watch that. <laughs> You don't look hungry anymore. <laughs> I'm, I'm refreshed. Um, I would like to start with Board President Naylor. Aye. Director Green. Aye. Director Oyserman. Aye. Director Perry. Aye. And Director Shea. Aye. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Consent calendar approved um, unanimously. Moving on to item D, public comment. Open time for items not on the agenda. Let me guess. <clears throat> yes, Jeff, one second here. Yes, Stephen. Uh, little comments that you're making, by the way. Um, good. Good. Well, you know, you, you should talk to me in person and not snipe at me like that. Um, but uh, anyhow, um, I'd, I'd like to point out the fact, uh, I, I think there may be a little bit of a misunderstanding of um, where our revenue comes from. Yes, it comes from taxes, but also uh, a broad category called business, which is revenue that comes in on a uh, undeterminate schedule. It's a pretty sizable portion of our budget and so um, just like every other business, when business uh, conditions change and business slows down, there should be some adjustments going forward. S certainly, I think uh, it can be said that our staff has not been operating at 100% of their normal capacity, given the fact that uh, they have been sheltering in place. Um, it's kind of appalling to me as guardians of, of the district's funds that you wouldn't take a sober look at ways to streamline uh, operations during this year. We do 
have tremendous expenses uh, uh, forecast for the district. And, uh, you know, where do you plan to get that money? I mean, you're going to materialize it. I guess you're going to uh, float another bond issue. That's the only thing I can guess. But wouldn't it be better not to have excess expenses at a time when uh, business is slow? Um, these are things that, as our representatives, we expect you to, you know, be on the lookout for us. Uh, you know, we're not an employment agency. We're a, we're a business. We are a, a, a park district. We're a recreation district. We provide services, and um, we should uh, strive to uh, do them in the, the best way we can for, for the people. That's all I have to say. Okay, thank you. I appreciate your comments, Stephen. I think we're doing our best to make sure that the non-tax, non-fee um, revenue programs are being appropriately dealt with, and both from the revenue side and the expense side. And I do believe that when we go through the budget this evening, you'll notice that um, we are not projecting a huge loss for the upcoming fiscal year. Um, okay, is there, let's see, is there anyone else that would like to comment from the public that would like to comment? No, okay, else, uh, yeah, I mean, uh, utilizing the raise hand feature if anybody else wants to make a comment. Should, we, ad should we address the email or no? No. Okay. Okay. Um, if there are no other comments, we'll move on. Thank you. To item E, district matters. Item E1, the draft budget for 2020-2021. Eric, would you like to lead us off? Yes, please. Uh, thanks, Jeff. Um, so I, you know, gave you guys a little bit of a detailed memo here. You know, just kind of refreshing from what was. <laughs> presented last month were two hypothetical budget models, one showing no uh, impact to summer due to the public health crisis, and another one showing if we were to shut down all summer programs. Uh, as was noted, both showed a uh, level of a net operating gain in terms of revenue over expense, and it was stated at that meeting that the final proposed budget would fall somewhere between those two uh, hypothetical models. So now that we have gotten our final um, guidance from public health in regards to summer camps, we were able to finish off at least planning for the portion of summer camp. I will say briefly um, that just Friday afternoon, public health issued some limited guidance um, towards limited pool operations. Um, from a public pool perspective, um, we have not had a chance to thoroughly analyze that. So none of that is taken into account here when staff has a chance to really look at those numbers and see if uh, what is being allowed would make sense to operate, we will address that at that time. So this does not include anything that just came out on Friday, late afternoon, evening in regards to uh, very limited public pool operations as released by public health. Um, as you can kind of see in here, and I think some of the points that were made earlier, especially with our programs, uh, and I've stated this at multiple past meetings, uh, our programs, you know, when you look at the revenue, 75 to 80% of that is caught up in variable expense. That's our part-time staffing, that's supplies, that's trips, that's uh, increased utility usage, everything else. So, so to be very clear, during our shutdown, we've had dozens, if not uh, closer to uh, 100 staff that have not been working, that have not received any level of compensation, lifeguards who were hired for the pool that did not get to work, preschool teachers who were out of work, after school staff who were out of work, and simply did not have opportunity to earn. And as the expenditures reflect that when you look at the actuals and when you look at what we have put together. The, uh, I, I, the one things I kind of want to also make clear is that this budget is based entirely on what we knew at the time the budget was produced and published, which was regarding summer camps. Um, there is still a lot of uncertainty that surrounds this entire uh, 
health crisis and nobody can predict what that exactly looks like. That said, um, we've been thoughtful in what we put together and conservative in our revenue estimates uh, for our summer camp. I don't know what will exactly happen in the fall, but uh, we this is budgeted for fall programming returning to normal with our after school programs as well as our preschool programs, which uh, without uh, uh, quoting me on this, uh, if things were even to stay the same in the groups that they are in, our registration numbers would most likely be able to accommodate that level of programming anyway with how many kids we typically enroll. But we have not scaled those back yet. Um, and then again, I also have my note that when you're taking a seasonal activity and trying to spread it across two fiscal years, that has inherent challenges with it in itself. So as we learn more, you know, not only throughout this summer, but through the fall and leading into spring, I anticipate, uh, you know, uh, several periodic adjustments happening during the fiscal year. Um, I'm happy uh, to answer any questions on this budget in particular. You will see compared to the model showing no summer, um, our net gain, so to speak, of, uh, revenue over expenditures increased by about $40,000 to a projected $180,000. And that's after and including contributions uh, to both our OPEB trust and the board designated reserves uh, at the same $100,000 levels that has been achieved in the past year. And I recommend at this point in time that the board adopt this budget as presented, but again, taking into account the strong likelihood of future budget amendments as we learn more about impacts to our potential future operations throughout the fiscal year. Does anyone on the board have any questions for Eric on the budget? I'm seeing two no's. Sivan? No? I mean, no, but I was curious are we do we enroll for the preschool about 12 kids per group is that what you're saying that's pretty close luke you can uh -huh. you can chime in um yeah we um typically take uh, a small handful more in each of the classes but um uh, we would be able to run the program with 12 and still cover expenses and and it wouldn't it wouldn't be a huge change to, to reduce okay. to 12. Yeah, I asked all the other questions I had about the budget that's proposed to Eric earlier. Okay, so. thank you, Sivan. Bill, anything from you? No, I was just looking at the tree maintenance and the pest. It looks like the pest control climbed significantly this year. During the, and that's why the budget is higher for the, this budget process now. But I was wondering about the uh, maintenance uh, of the trees and everything, is that going to come under our wildfire? Does that have anything to do with the wildfire uh, monies that we're going to um, get, I guess, from the passage of, what was it, Measure C or D? Uh, let me answer your question in two parts. Uh, the main increase in the pest control that you saw is because during the year last year we started implementing a gopher trapping service because they were wrecking havoc on our turfs. So that service as well as updated cost of our regular uh, pest and rodent and termite uh, treatments that happen around the building are now all incorporated into there. The tree maintenance line that you're looking at is specific to park. Um, and this is more for diseased, hazardous type trees, okay. not necessarily a vegetation management aspect. So no, I wouldn't imagine those would uh, cross. Uh, I think Luke's got something to add. Okay. Yeah, Luke, go ahead. Um, yeah, thanks. Uh, and just one, one ask, we did have some, some tree maintenance work uh, planned for this, this year that hasn't taken place because of uh, the shelter order. Um, a lot of the work was not uh, necessarily deemed essential or to be uh, an immediate hazard so we haven't done all the maintenance we would normally be doing this last spring season just because um we're sort of following the guidelines to not do anything that wasn't considered essential so we would have spent some more of that um this spring it had been a normal season right. we also have a couple outstanding invoices too so that line that you see with the may actuals 
uh, will increase by the by year end when the invoices are processed. Makes sense. Okay. Anything else from the board? Starting the budget. Okay. I'd like to ask if anyone from the public has a comment on the budget. They do. One second, uh, Jeff. Oh yes. Um, F9 on the phone and the raise hand feature if you're on the web. Steven. Yeah, hi. Um, yeah, so I'm really kind of disappointed in this uh, downturn season that we're not doing major maintenance on the pool. We'll have to do that uh, in the future. Um, I know apparently you had someone tell you that you didn't need to do it, but that's a very, very important thing and, and the, the, probably the most costly thing to the community because we will not have access to the pool during that time. So this year was the ideal year not to get a double hit on the pool use. So I, you know, I don't know if it's too late, but I would hope that you would reconsider that. Um, when you talk about you know, meeting all your budgets. Well, from a community member standpoint, we're not getting a whole lot out of the district uh, these days. You're running the summer camp, but in terms of access, you know, we, we, we can walk around the park, but we can't go into the pool. We, we're, we're severely limited in, in our activities. So we're not really getting our value there. So don't pat yourself on the shoulder and say you got a positive budget there. No, you're not really delivering um, services as you have in the past. Um, as far as uh, well, I, I did uh, I did say that uh, earlier that that I think that uh, this is a time to to consider cut, cutting back some of uh, uh, cutting back personnel to reflect the actual workload being carried. Um, uh, apparently you guys don't want to do that. I guess we'll have to talk about that later. You're asking for a tax increase in the fall. Maybe you want to consider these things um, before you approve this uh, budget. Um, but, uh, you know, there's some big outstanding cost and let's not forget about PERS and and the and uh, and the health care uh, that we have do for our employees. We want to take care of our employees, and so this is the the number one thing. The other thing is too with, during this COVID crisis, we've seen an uptick in the use of the park. People are out walking every day in the park. They love they love the park, and in particular the elderly and and um, people that you normally don't out. Uh, see walking they they're using the park which is great but um, I don't see anything in the budget uh, where uh, to improve the trails to put in park benches to uh, do anything basically for our senior population and those of us on the uh, upper end of uh, retirement age it's going to come a lot quicker than you think and you might actually enjoy sitting on a park bench at some point. So I, I don't really, I don't see it in the budget and I, you know, we keep asking for the same things and I know you're going to be talking about Measure A tonight and you, you know, it's all going into Bill Hansel's project and uh, I think that you're, you're missing out here because you do have uh, your service to the community to think about. Okay, thank you, Stephen. Appreciate your comments. Um, as a reminder, generally speaking, when we do um, full replastering of the pool, we'll do it off season when no one is using the pool. This will not be taking the pool away from anyone in the community. Also, doing it ahead of time just simply um, spends money that we don't need to during this crisis. Um, so let's not forget about the um, wisdom of our staff who is trying to matriculate through this um, event and keep those funds um, for future use. All right, um, let's see. 
Does anyone on the board have any other questions? Just a statement the that the kids will be using the pool during summer camp. So, Say yes. Again? Oh, yes. The kids uh -huh. will be using the pool this summer. Yes, the community wide may not be able to, but the kids at the community at the school, sorry, the kids at the camp okay. will be able to use the pool. And most of the kids in the camp are Marinwood residents. That's yes, very good. Thank you. Okay. Hearing no other comments, can I have a motion to approve the 2020-2021 budget as presented? So moved. Second. Okay. okay, we have a a motion and a second. Um, Tiffany, roll call, please. Board President Naylor. Aye. Director Green. Aye. Director Oyserman. Aye. Director Perry. Aye. And Director Shea. Aye. Thank you. Okay, that passes unanimously. Thank you. Um, and I, Jeff, can I just intervene for one second? When we have motions and seconds to make sure that we're very clear on who makes the motion and who makes the second for uh, record keeping uh, for Tiffany's purpose. Oh, okay. Because sometimes was, uh, it gets a little, uh, I'm getting the thumbs up there. Sometimes it gets a little hard to follow who exactly motioned and who seconded. Uh, Tiffany, I'm assuming you captured that with the budget uh, vote there. I have a motion from Director Green and a second from Director Perry. Is that correct? Yes. Thank Perfect. you. Thank you. Uh -huh. I would say by the end of this year, I ought to get this right. Anyway. <laughs> Moving on, item E2, resolution 2020-04, determining fiscal year 2020-2021 appropriations limit on tax proceeds. Eric, would you like to lead us off? Yeah, sure. I'll try to keep this as simple as I can. Uh, this really is a ministerial duty matter of the board. You are required every year to um, pass uh, and adopt an appropriations limit. And to be very clear, an appropriations limit does not set tax levels, it does not increase tax levies, and it's not even really based on what our taxes are when it comes to determining the appropriations limit. All data is based on prior year, as well as a formula of numbers that is provided directly from the California State Department of Finance. If you look at the page past the uh, resolution, you can see the factors that go into play uh, up top. Again, all of those come from what's known as the May report from the Department of Finance from the state of California. These aren't numbers that we produce or we choose. Um, we take it from their report. And to be clear again, all an appropriations limit is, is it sets a spending limit on tax proceeds. So it means that as a, we cannot grow our tax spending by levels higher than the uh, appropriations limit will allow you to do it based on those price and population factors from the Department of Finance. And then you also calculate in our voter approved special taxes, uh, which are then applied after you create your general appropriations limit for general uh, ad valorem property taxes. I tried to keep it simple. It's a little tricky to understand. <laughs> the, the step is in no way, shape or form increases taxes to residents, nor does it in any way, shape or form propose new taxes. Thank you, Eric. Does anyone on the board have any questions? No. no. Okay, I'm hearing none. And I will open it up to the public for any questions. Again, yes, raise there you hand go. or F9 if you're on the phone. Thank you. Go ahead, Stephen. Thank you. Um, so uh, it's being called uh, a mis ministerial um, uh, procedure because uh, the, the staff is looking for the blessing of spending up to the maximum amount um, uh, allowed under law. I suggest and 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 as it was described and i don't want to be unfair but this is based on prior year um, expenditures 
I would like to say this is the year, this is the year where you pause and you really look at expenses and look how you can do things better. It doesn't mean, uh, it doesn't, it doesn't mean that necessarily you're going to spend less, but maybe you'll get more done with the same amount of budget. Um, I think it would be wonderful if you voted against it. I've never seen a board vote against it. I don't know why. I would wish you guys would take your responsibility a as uh, uh, guardians uh, of the public purse s more uh, uh, serious, but... Uh, uh, please consider that action tonight. Thank you, Stephen. Is there anyone else from the public that would care to comment? Jeff, if I could just, there is nobody else from the public, I'm sorry. Um, okay. As a point of uh, correction here, it is not based on the prior year expenditures. It is based on the prior year appropriations limit, which is calculated year over year based on a specific formula. Our tax revenues are actually less than what the appropriations limit was. We won't have that much tax revenue. The formula is set and controlled by the Department of Finance. And again, it's based on the prior year's appropriation limit, not anything to do with expenditure level. Okay. If there are no further questions, I'll ask for a motion to approve the Resolution 2020-04, determining the fiscal year 2020-2021 appropriations limit on tax proceeds. So moved. Isabella, motions? Sivan seconds. Sivan seconds. Any further comment? Just that I had a typo on the resolution because the resolution is basically copied over and updated every year. And last year you were absent at this particular meeting, Jeff. So the resolution in the packet shows you as absent, which you obviously are not and will be corrected uh, when the appropriate voting uh, results are uh, updated. Okay, fair enough. I Tiffany, that. ready for a roll call? Hey, Board President Naylor. Aye. Director Green. Aye. Director Oysterman. Aye. Director Perry. Aye. And Director Shea. Aye. Thank you. Thank you. All right, we'll move on to item E3, fiscal year 2020, 2021, publicly available. There's another typo. Um, pay schedule, all positions. Eric? Sure, for the record, publicly is actually spelled two different ways. Sometimes there's an A in it and sometimes there's an L in it. Yeah, but there's always a V and available. <laughs> um, I see available uh, in there, a V and available. Oh, I didn't. Yeah. Not on my copy. That's all right. I have smaller, uh, I have smaller type font in here. Uh, again, this is a, uh, a matter that the district has to approve every year. This does not uh, change or impact any wages. It, re it represents either ranges to wages or in some cases, the steps in wages. Um, it does represent uh, increases due to the state mandated uh, minimum wage increase where applicable, and it also represents the fiscal year uh, previously approved wages for firefighter personnel uh, in accordance with their MOU. Right, okay. And this is what goes on our website, yes? Correct. Okay. Questions for the board, from the board. Okay, um, I want to offer my apologies. The typo was on my form, not yours. <laughs> <clears throat> so you're cool. Okay, if there's nothing from the board, um, is there anyone in the, uh, from the public that would like to comment on item E3? Uh, yes, Steven Sand is raised, one second. So, so, you know, obviously our staff, uh, when they do a good jo job, really deserve uh, uh, competitive pay. Um, however, you know, in slow times, maybe this isn't the year to consider expanding that base. Uh, I've urged you to consider uh, staff reductions, furloughs, other things to reduce our expenses. 
and it really seems like you guys are doing business as usual, uh, rubber stamping every request for increased taxes, increase uh, salary, increase uh, number of jobs uh, uh, for the district, and you know that's going to bite us because, as you know, every one of these jobs has uh, a lot of expenses attached to them. So. Uh, Probably is not going to do any good to, to say it, but I want it to be heard that uh, we need to be prudent during these these times. Uh, a lot of businesses are closing. A lot of uh, layoffs have happened in the community. Who knows what it's going to do to the real estate market? But you know, I don't think we can. Uh, I don't think last year is any indication of what we're going to see this year, or maybe for the next couple of years. So. I urge you, you caution and prudence. Thank you, Stephen. Um, again, these are uh, pay schedules. This, uh, other than the fire department, right, which I think uh, firefighters go through a step process. Their MOU is dictated um, some increases this year. I don't think anyone else um, is necessarily other than um, by moving up a step going to get a raise, but that's my opinion. If anyone on the, on the staff would like to correct me, please feel free to do so. Okay, if I hear- no, You're right, Jeff, just that minimum wage. Yep, exactly. I think we had a janitorial, janitorial position that was up by a dollar an hour. Is that correct? That's That was the increase in minimum wage. Yep, okay, thank you. Um, if there are no other questions, I'd like to um, have a motion to approve the fiscal year 2020-2021 publicly available pay schedules of all positions. So moved. Leah goes. Leah goes. Um, I, I got you, Isabella, with a motion. Who's seconded? Got a second, Leah. Or do you want me to second? I'll second. Sivan seconds. Sivan seconding. Thank you. Thank you. If there's no further discussion, uh, Tiffany, can we take roll call? Sure thing. Uh, Board President Naylor. Aye. Director Green. Aye. Director Oysterman. Aye. Director Perry. Aye. Director Shea. Aye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Moving on to item E4. Resolution 2020-05, a regularly scheduled election to be held in this jurisdiction. Requesting the Board of Supervisors to consolidate with any other election conducted on said date and requesting elected election services by Marin County Elections Department. Eric, do you have anything to clarify? Yeah, this you? one's pretty straightforward. You've got a board election coming up. There's three seats coming up. I've even included information on uh, filing for election in there. And to the best of my knowledge, that's the only election we have coming up uh, this November is for the three board seats. Very good. Okay. Any questions from the board? All right. I'll open it up to any members of the public that would like to comment. Yes. One second, Jeff. Yes, Stephen. Let the games begin. Um, no, I, I um, you know, this, this election is an important election, and I don't know how many of you are going to be seeking re-election, but I will tell you this, that um, the business of the district is of great concern. Uh, you mentioned the email. I guess uh, Eric shared it with the rest of you. I uh, sent it to the district. Uh, as well as uh, the district attorney and Damon Connolly. I think the Marinwood district is so far out of the norm of uh, open government, uh, ethical government. I, I think you guys really need, uh, need, it needs to, need, we need to air this in public and um, I think that your relationship with Mr. Hansel and the, the choice of not disclosing uh, what's going on there and going 
with a very expensive, very large project uh, that violates uh, uh, our stream conservation area, violates our recreation area, sucks up all our money. I think that's going to be a big issue, I, you know. And I, I just encourage you if you're, if if you know you're, you feel that you're this is really good stuff and start selling it to the public because you really haven't sold uh, your plans to the public. You've just basically kept it secret. And my objective is to make sure that people know what's going on. So, um, good luck. Thank you, Stephen. Are there any other comments from the public? Seeing none, um, I may have a motion to approve resolution 2020-05, a regularly scheduled election to be held in the jurisdiction, in this jurisdiction and all the rest. So moved. Second. Thank you, Bill. And a second from Isabella. Is there any further comment? Tiffany? Ward President Naylor. Aye. Director Green. Aye. Director Oysterman. Aye. Director Perry. Aye. And Director Shea. Aye. Thank you. Thank you. Item E5, temporary construction license agreement between Marinwood CSD and P. P, G, and E to allow for PG and E to conduct gas pipeline pressure testing within Marinwood property. Eric? Yes, yeah, so PG and E approached us, um, I don't know, maybe about a month ago with a proposal to utilize a piece of our property to conduct this testing. As you know, a massive uh, county long gas transmission pipeline runs right through Marinwood, um, somewhat parallel to Las Colinas, and then eventually up through into Novato, as well as down all the way to south, uh, southern Marin. Um, my understanding is they've actually have multiple of these projects planned um, up and down throughout the county, occurring right around the same time frame, and they're just looking for convenient spots where they don't have to dig up private property and or roadways by which to do the work. This is all part of their safety protocols that they have put into uh, put into effect. The original agreement uh, went to our county attorney, our county council, uh, our just legal counsel for the district. Um, they came back with a heavily revised version of it, which we proposed back to PG&E. And that is actually what you see in front of you. Um, pg and &E essentially accepted all of our terms and conditions for them to use our land. Uh, this particular area is not a, uh, a traffic area. It is close to a few residents, but those residents are also, I actually spoke with one of them last week, are uh, understanding and accustomed to the fact that uh, they even, one of the one I spoke to has this easement that runs right through his private property as well. Um, they understand it's kind of in the name of safety and uh, it won't affect, there is one small trail that's in this same general area, but it won't affect that. To be clear, this, uh, the parcel number is, the, I listed it on there, 1642104. It is the area off of Heatherstone Drive and Limestone Grade, uh, more commonly referred to as Grasshopper Hill. Um, when I went out to view the property, I actually uh, randomly encountered about six PG&E workers out there doing some more of their survey work uh, and wound up talking to them as well. So they provided some assurances on everything um, and said that they didn't feel it would actually take six months, but they like to give themselves this opportunity. That said, the uh, um, compensation proposal is set at the six month mark, which was 31,500 by PG&E. And the one thing I would state that, you know, they didn't state directly, um, but that was also, you know, discussed uh, amongst myself and council was PG&E has a lot of rights and a lot of easement abilities. And uh, they certainly, if they wanted to, could start to exploit some of those rights um, because they do have an easement to be able to access their pipeline uh, through and where it runs. So this is basically us uh, agreeing to allow them to do this on district property under our terms, as opposed to terms they could otherwise uh, forcibly attempt. 
Thank you, Eric. Does any member of the board have any questions? I, ha I asked mine before. Okay, thank you. I'm, I'm seeing none. Um, this is, I've asked my questions and I've also um, had Eric confirm that things that I would normally look at um, in terms of um, start and stop times of construction, nighttime work, um, sound, et cetera, et cetera, are all covered within county permitting and are not part of the agreement. I mean, they're not specified in the agreement. They're part of the uh, permitting process. Their responsibility to obtain and adhere to all county permit requirements, though, is specified in the agreement. Correct. Understood. Yes. Okay. All right. I'll open it up to any questions that uh, the public may have. Here, one second here. Go ahead, Stephen. Yeah. Um, so when PG&E started showing up at uh, uh, Las Galinas and Miller Creek Road a couple of years ago, I thought, oh, good, they're fixing stuff. Uh, the uh, the fire on the peninsula, the terrible fire and explosions on the peninsula was fresh in everybody's memory. But they keep coming back, and I'm wondering what the heck is going on in our neighborhood because um, I see them out there all the time. My concern with this, I, I have no – I mean, I, I want them to do the work, obviously, but my concern is uh, what – risk does the public uh, have to uh, uh, take on with work uh, on that particular piece of property? I'm not familiar with it, so I don't know. Um, but if I live next door to it, I sure would want to know that because um, uh, things go boom and, you know, hopefully everything will go well. But, but uh, um, so there's that. There's the, the potential of, of, of an unsafe situation for the neighborhoods, but also um, that would also probably re residually impact us should an accident occur uh, and we were found to have leased that property to PG&E. Um, I, I don't know how you, what, how that's been explored. I'm sure it was an issue that was brought up, uh, at least by the attorney, but um, I guess I'd like a little bit, a little bit of confidence there that you guys are looking at at the safety of the community there and granting this uh, access. Thank you, Stephen. Um, yes, I believe that a, a lot of the uh, safety issues are covered, whether in the permit or in the agreement, and also liability and held harmless clauses um, have been worked on by the attorney. And I think they, um, Eric and the attorney, have done a good job of making sure that um, our district is protected. Eric, do you have anything further to add? It's page two, uh, item number four, indemnification as far as uh, PG&E's sole and complete liability and responsibility, as well as their responsibility to defend the district should that come to that, uh, as well as uh, hold harmless uh, property owner. Very good, thank you. Okay. Does the board have any further questions? Oh, is there anyone else in the public that has a question? No, not this time. Okay, thank you. Um, if the if there is no further conversation from the board, may I have a motion to approve temporary construction license agreement between Marinwood CSD and PG&E to allow PG&E to conduct gas pipeline pressure testing within the Marinwood territory? For property. Yeah, Jeff, if I could, um, the recommendation is yes to approve it, but specifically you're authorizing the district manager to execute the uh, temporary construction license agreement. Thank you for that clarification. Yes. So does anyone have any questions about what that means? Okay. Again, a motion to approve. So moved. Isabella, thank you. Sivan seconds. Sivan seconds. Tiffany? Board President Naylor? Aye. Director Green? Aye. Director Oysterman? Aye. 
Director Perry? Aye. And Director Shea? Aye. Thank you. Thank you. I believe we're moving on to item E6. E6, the district manager's report. Eric? Again, yeah, just trying to catch up my pack here. Um, Mr. Mayor, one second. Okay. Uh, yeah, just a few items in there. I mean, as you can tell by the packet, uh, there's been a lot of stuff we've been working on, and most of it is contained in there. Um, I, I really wanted to use the opportunity to highlight and make note of the absolute tremendous efforts of all of our staff, really, from firefighters to park personnel. Um, but especially our, our summer camp staff as well, who have been, uh, you know, throughout, um, I would say, have been working over 100% and have constantly been dealing with evolving and changing conditions and adjusting to how to conduct work in a more remote setting. They've done an amazing job, and especially these last, you know, two, three weeks as we really started gearing up, having a clear understanding leading up to and then with the uh, final uh, guidelines, they are now attempting to, and not attempting, they are accomplishing in two weeks period of time what they normally have a couple of months to accomplish um, with basically trying to re-register and figure everything out and doing programs like we've never done them before, having meetings with uh, the school district that I was a part in as well. Um, and they certainly deserve, and I think Luke's going to touch on that in his report, a little bit of a, uh, an incredible debt of gratitude for their willingness to partner and work with us uh, in the name of uh, providing uh, opportunities for families and kids to have uh, better resources available to them at camp. Um, so again, just I, I listed them by name in there, but uh, you know, Luke and uh, as our rec supervisor, rec director, and Robin as our assistant rec director, Stephanie, Carolyn, Tiffany uh, should have been listed in there too, just with her work with Carolyn on processing cancellations and everything else. It's, uh, I've been doing this a long time with a lot of teams uh, sitting in a management setting. I'm, I'm as uh, proud and as impressed with their collective efforts as I have ever been. So just, wanted to take a second in my report to note them because the work they've achieved is it's remarkable um, and then just a couple other quick notes in there obviously I have a quick note on some of my involvement with the wildfire prevention authority um, and i'm sure uh, chief white will touch on that a little bit more in his upcoming report and then in terms of uh, vegetation management you know once again kind of uh, highlighting the assistance of the uh, vegetation management inspectors that work for San Rafael Fire Department and uh, a lot of gratitude towards them and their export expertise, as well as uh, their knowledge of, you know, the, the various vendors and the means of how to get things done. Um, we are do have one small project that is moving forward. Um, at this time, I remain hopeful it'll actually be reimbursable through the MWPA, but uh, I do have a signed agreement. We're just trying to confirm dates uh, where we'll be bringing goats to come and graze um, behind the homes on Idleberry, starting basically from the county farm property where Marinwood jurisdiction ends and running uh, along that, uh, kind of creating a defensible uh, space zone behind all of the homes all the way until you reach Queenstone uh, Fire Road. It's approximately 15 acres that they will be, I mean, obviously there's a lot more acres out there, but that zone is about a 15 acre zone running from that stretch. Uh, we are trying hard to get that in before the end of this month. That would be fun to watch. It's usually watch a crowd out. favorite. They do warn, uh, and once that happens that, uh, uh, you know, there is some mild electrical current that runs through the fences that they keep moving as the goats graze along the path. So don't touch the fence. Yeah. <laughs> it was it was a major thing that everybody went to when the stay at home order was first first in place. It was like the place to be seen. <laughs> well, and again, Chief, uh, please feel free to chime in on this uh, as much more of a subject matter expert than I am. Uh, you know, goat grazing is not an end-all be-all. It is a wonderful first step and it helps, you know, bring down some of the tall grasses and uh, some of the invasive shrubs that go through those areas. Uh, and, and, but, you know, which then helps, you know, for some of the larger clearance needs, of, you know, some of the limbing and some of the uh, removal of some of the uh, dead fuels and things like that. Chief, if you have anything else you want to add on that or just wait till your uh, report. 
please feel free. I'll, I'll chime in right after I start my report because I've got a, an area that should segue into that a little bit. Beautiful. Thank you, sir. Thank Very you. Good. Any questions on the uh, manager report? Okay. Um, opening up to the public for questions on the direct district manager's report. Sorry. Yeah, one second here, Jeff. So I guess the reason why you guys never have questions is because you've been briefed prior to the meeting of what is going to occur. I'm glad that uh, Eric is happy with his staff. Um, I, I know I know those people. They're great people, and I, I know that they, they, they are capable of really good work. Um, it is very frustrating that um, the request for information just – you know, activity kind of information of the general manager had to go to uh, your lawyer to prevent uh, any information coming out of what, what's been going on for the last three months. I feel like you're really taking advantage of this situation in unfair ways. Um, I'm glad to hear uh, Savan say that the open space on Idleberry is well used. That's fantastic, and I we're all out in the open space so much more. I really think that um, there needs to be more district resources spent in the open space, trail maintenance in particular. We don't want a uh, repeat of uh, the uh, uh, slide situation, and that can be addressed very easily by, by uh, trail work. Um, and, uh, you know, we're, we're more... We're about, we're, you know, there's a big community here. It's not just summer camp and a pool. There, there's, uh, you know, a senior community. There's, there's, uh, there's this beautiful open space. There's this wonderful watershed that, that uh, we are stewards of. And, um, uh, you know, we don't see any effort um, uh, placed in that. Lastly, I, I actually, this came up earlier from before. I'm going to uh, just ask you about it um maybe it's maybe we'll wait next section but uh i noticed you you have a rescue vehicle for open space or rescue basket and I, it was unclear to me whether that was just a litter or that was the actual vehicle that that's going to be purchased i'll just leave that out there maybe maybe chief white can um address that in his presentation so that's all i have to say okay thank you Stephen. Okay, if there's nothing else on uh, the district manager's report, we'll move on. Item F, fire, fire department matters. Um, item F1, draft minutes of the fire commission meeting, June 2nd. Does anyone have any questions about the meeting minutes? No? Nothing from the board. Does any member of the public have any questions about the meeting minutes? No. Okay, I'm not hearing any. Uh, we'll move to item F2, Chief Officer Report and Activity Summary. Chief? Well, good evening, uh, Director Naylor and uh, District Manager Dreykeson and the other board of directors uh, and the public members, uh, Mr. Nessel. Um, Thank you for allowing me to, to join you this evening and provide some updates on some of the current uh, that the fire department is involved in. And I think I'll start with the question that was asked uh, uh, by Mr. Stephen Nestle. Um, I'm not familiar with the vehicle that you speak of, but I will do some research and find out if this was actually just a litter basket for rescue purposes or whether or not there is some other larger request underway that I'm not familiar with. But I don't believe that's the case. So I would probably um, go along with the mindset that maybe there's some specialized uh, new litter basket that we're looking to replace, maybe some aging equipment, perhaps a metal litter basket that's kind of aged and maybe past its serviceable life. I don't know. I'm just speculating. So uh, start with that. But I'll move on now into just, again, some of the highlights of my report. And please feel free to ask any questions you might have. I'll start with the Marin Wildfire Prevention Authority. And I'd like to provide you with some updates on some of the recent activities. But 
Um, let me start by saying that um, there's been a lot of work being put in by a bunch of dedicated and professional and folks working in earnest to try to get key projects off the ground as quickly as possible that will help to draw down risk for this fire season and well beyond. And so with that, I just want to uh, mention that we do have the operations committee that's been working hard. Uh, District Manager Drakerson has helped develop bylaws. We spoke to those bylaws just a few days ago, uh, got some input, and I think there's going to be a final version coming forward that may be presented to the board as soon as June 18th. Uh, and that's specific to the committee and their efforts to try to understand and be certain about what decisions they're empowered to make versus the, uh, the governing board. Um, but that being said, there's other committees that are, that are working hard right now. Some of them are working on the year one funding options and budget development. Uh, another committee is working under the Measure C Tax Administration. The other is working right now on the Executive Officer Recruitment. Uh, yet another, the Ops Committee is working on the MWPA um, work plan for 2020. And that's a pretty large undertaking right now. Uh, we're trying to align and figure out with that work plan what funding should go under the three allocations, one being the four core programmatic areas that comprise roughly 60% of the um, funding. The other is primarily defensible space related, which is another 20% of the funding. And then the last 20% are local or agency specific needs um, that each agency is able to spend money towards projects that are of um, significance to them specifically. And so with that, um, on May 14th, there was comment and public input uh, that came from the Marin Audubon Society and the, the chapter of the Native Plant Society, which I just learned in conjunction with one other entity, which I can't seem to recall right now, have, have formed to become something called FERN. And although I don't have the information for, for the uh, board right now to speak to what FERN uh, pneumonic uh, means that it's really a combination of all the environmental agencies who are trying to come together to ensure that environment, environmental considerations and best practices are utilized to ensure that what's being done right now when it impacts birds, when it impacts um, possibly endangered species or certain um, uh, ecological impacts, they're trying to make sure that those things are incorporated into the thought process and into the planning and projects so that there's minimal to no impact as best um, that they can move forward on reducing or limiting the impact on those um, very sensitive areas and species. Um, moving beyond that, May 21st, the Ops Committee presented to the Governing Board of Directors and they give a progress report and updates on some of the things I just identified regarding the work plan and other activities. Some of the guiding principles for those projects, just for your awareness, um, include public safety and risk reduction, effective use of public funds, um, coordination and collaboration among agencies, which obviously was one of the main tenets of Measure C. There was uh, also some lengthy discussion on how you could incentivize voluntary compliance through education and support, as opposed to using the hammer methodology of trying to provide heavy enforcement for compliance with some of the things we're expecting across all zones when it comes to vegetation management and or um, defensible space requirements. The application of ecologically sound practices and social and environmental equity, as I spoke to earlier, is one of the, the um, more vocal and um, active uh, aspects of what they're trying to accomplish with the guiding principles. As I indicated, the projects fall into three main categories. The draft bylaws have been created uh, thanks to District Manager Drakerson, who really took the lead on that. And, excuse me, the executive officer recruitment is underway. Um, I forgot exactly how many candidates they said they received, but I thought there was some upwards of 50. And the actual um, application period closes tomorrow. So that being said, there's a, a real healthy interest in individuals who uh, may be uh, suited and or qualified to pursue this opportunity. There is some question about how many folks are gonna actually be the core group that they're looking to interview and move forward in the process. I think there's somewhere up, upwards of eight to 12 um, that will probably be the finalist that they deem to be the most qualified and will move forward for, um, for final interviews and vetting. 
Um, Moving forward from that, I want to get into vegetation management a little bit and speak to some of the things that are marine wood specific and just um, um, important for us as we look at what we're trying to accomplish moving forward for both and marine wood communities. I actually um, we had the opportunity about three plus weeks ago, almost a month ago now, to meet with uh, Chief Tyler in Nevada and Chief Weber in Marin County to understand how their vegetation management programs we're operating and I, I see stark differences between the two programs uh, at least for this year I'm not sure if that's going to continue to be the challenge moving forward but the model is looking at wildfire mitigation specialists which are a highly trained or a higher level of training and a higher compensation group of individuals who would work on a year-round basis as opposed to the model utilized by Marin County which is comprised of seasonal staff uh, paid a bit less and um, or, or higher turnover, if you will, with those individuals. But Cal, excuse me, Marin County looks at those individuals as potential future employees. So um, they're getting their goals accomplished, but I don't know that they're getting the quality they're looking for with that model. And so I, I'm looking at a hybrid model of the two that I think might work best for our communities in San Rafael and Marinwood. And so with that, um, we weren't able to access Marin County seasonal inspectors this year because they ran into some difficulty with securing sufficient staff who are interested in the opportunity to be seasonal inspectors. So they were challenged with having enough inspectors to go out and provide the services for the communities that had already been on board with utilizing the Marin County model. So we've actually posted uh, vegetation seasonal inspector positions on Cal Ops, Western Daily Dispatch. Uh, we uh, advertised throughout a bunch of the regional community colleges and by word of mouth. And I'm happy to say as of last Friday, we had 27 some odd individuals who had applied. We offered compensation that was just a couple of dollars more than what the Marin County seasonal inspection um, staff were being offered in the low 20s per hour. Uh, our staff, including Sean Rule, who's, uh, who originates from Marinwood, uh, and Matt Urias and others are gonna be providing those individuals with training. But first, obviously, we've gotta go through uh, a questionnaire, an interview process, background checks, and then onboarding those individuals. What I'm really happy to share with you, though, is that last year we had two inspection staff, and those inspection staff really only cover roughly a third of the parcels uh, that exist between the San Rafael and Marinwood communities. And that's fairly alarming, I think. Our efforts this year are looking to hire six more seasonal inspectors to go along with those two tenured staff and be forced multipliers out in the inspection program. And so obviously, Marinwood community is going to benefit from that direct enhancement and increase in inspection staff. And we're going to make sure that we're rolling out eight people to go out and conduct inspections. And we're hoping to get those out within the first week or two in July so that we can really get a robust effort moving forward. Um, the next thing we're also doing right now is we're in negotiation, excuse me, we're actually uh, finalized and got approval for AmeriCorps from St. Louis to come in and conduct more vegetation clearance, along with the goat grazing that um, District Manager uh, uh, Dreykosen spoke to, the AmeriCorps crews are going to work at helping to do some of the mechan mechanical um, clearance as opposed to the, the, the goat uh, grazing that really takes place at a very competitive price. Uh, we also have Delta Fire, Delta crews, excuse me, from Cal Fire, who are at a very competitive price that we're going to look to bring in and help be false multipliers towards our efforts to reduce vegetation in both Marinwood and San Rafael. So we've got a multi-pronged approach that we're trying to put forward right away. Um, it's a lot of work. Uh, we think that we'll be able to use the AmeriCorps crews to start working on evacuation zones and, and main roadside areas. Um, it could be a few challenges with using the Delta crews for the projects just by virtue of the fact that we don't want them working in highly congested high traffic areas but certainly the AmeriCorps crews will be part of that effort and you should start seeing some of their work underway again as early as uh, next Monday so um, I'm really happy to share that I think when we look back on this season as opposed to the pre uh, the prior season we should be able to see a marked difference in the amount of work we were able to accomplish by the end of the season. That's my anticipation. So, um, any questions on that? 
Chief, if I could just ask you briefly to explain the difference between the uh, AmeriCorps St. Louis crew that's, uh, that you're referring to versus the AmeriCorps NCCC uh, grant that uh, eventually got withdrawn by AmeriCorps that we were working in partnership with. Absolutely. Um, but, and, uh, speaking with Dyer, uh, the Triple C crews are probably not quite as trained and not as well equipped as the AmeriCorps St. Louis crews, not as experienced, um, probably require more oversight and more um, coordination than those other crews who are very seasoned, understand what they're doing. Um, you, you can almost plug and play with them and walk away. They're, they're just honed in from what I understand, and they're better equipped and better trained overall. So I think if we look at it from that vantage point, we actually are better off with AmeriCorps uh, St. Louis right now than we will be with the Triple C. Uh, not to discount Triple C's efforts, but clearly if we were going to lose both, we'd be in a bit of a predicament. But I think we have an advantage right now going with uh, the St. Louis crew. And so um, with that, they're going to be housed at one of our uh, locations on Joseph Court. And we're looking at a six-week window for them to be able to operate. And then that may be re-upped um, again later on towards sometime after the summer and early fall. They may come back and work for another six weeks. So we really anticipate getting a, a real significant contribution from, from the uh, uh, St. Louis AmeriCorps staff. Right. And then I would also add there is a, a significant cost difference involved with bringing on a St. Louis crew versus being awarded a NCCC crew. Yes, that's true as well. Um, we'll move on to another uh, section of my report, and uh, I hope you, you find a little bit of value in this one. Uh, I'm going to skip over real quick and come back. I wanted to speak about a promotion where Captain John Papanikola has successfully completed his captain's probation. So uh, I went over and spoke with him and the crew uh, and pinned his badge and, and congratulated him, much in the spirit of how Chief Gray had actually provided um, that same personal attention to staff once they're successfully beyond their probate or have successfully completed their probation. Uh, it's a little different than what I'm accustomed to. In the past, we would give someone a badge and we send them on their way and probation came and went without any real acknowledgement of their, their accomplishment. And I, I'm, I'm glad to see that there's an opportunity here to, to kind of just express some appreciation and give some added encouragement to the company and chief officers who and other individuals who actually have successfully completed probation. It's a, it's a worthy thing to actually acknowledge. Uh, sometimes you can do it in front of their families as I did with one of the captains uh, in San Rafael recently. But um, I think the big celebrations on the front end that they actually made it and were successful on the list and promoted. But this is still equally important because sometimes uh, you'll find that some individuals may not be suited and would like to revert, revert back to their prior rank or for whatever reason, they're just not a good fit, but in this case, it uh, looks like you guys selected well. So Captain uh, Papa Nicola is a permanent captain now in Marinwood. So congratulations to him, that's well done. Absolutely. Yes. Um, I guess the last thing I, I'd like to speak on is um, the Pacific Gas and Electric uh, Public Safety Power Shutoffs update provided to uh, staff just recently, they had uh, a presentation on the 3rd of last Wednesday, the 3rd of uh, June. Unfortunately, I wasn't able to attend that, but I did receive a lot of information from Quinn Gardner, who was able to attend in my absence. Um, some of the information I had already been familiar with, but she gave me some other additional highlights that I thought were important to, to speak to. Um, one of which is uh, pg e is hosting another WebEx meeting for the community on June 10th, tomorrow. So uh, please take a look at that link and consider joining that just to get more information that's gonna go above and beyond what I'm gonna share with you right now. Um, in their efforts to try to get ahead of the likelihood of additional PSPS events coming up um, this season, uh, pg e has taken a bunch of steps to try to improve and or reduce the input or the, excuse me, impact of PSPS events in Marinwood, San Rafael, and other communities. Some of the things they've done uh, are kind of uh, very meaningful if you look at it. They have a temporary microgrid as an example where they're looking at uh, possibly being allowed to safely energize certain areas within a community where they don't think there's gonna be a significant issue or concern with powering up those areas. And so 
being able to isolate certain areas within the community is going to be helpful, especially when you're talking about areas of the community where maybe there are vulnerable populations, uh, individuals who have medical needs that you know you can't really um, discount, and or those individuals may not have access to family members or transportation, uh, and any other number of challenges that may exist. And so those microgrids are going to be um, very helpful, I think, if they're able to actually employ those the way that they've been designed. In addition, uh, they've increased the number of inspectors to inspect the lines. They're undergrounding more lines. Uh, I understand they've got not literally hundreds of miles that they need to, to do undergrounding, which is, you can imagine, undergrounding takes a lot of time and resource, but it's something that they're actively doing. And they increased the number of helicopters, one of which, unfortunately, had an accident, I believe, last week, uh, which led to a fatality. But they upped them from 35 to 65 helicopters to go out and inspect lines. And so I'm not really sure um, how they intend to inspect lines with the helicopters. I'm not sure if they're using infrared or some other means of looking at how a line is powered or energized and whether or not there's some interruptions in current or some other methodology they use by doing an aerial assessment. But they're considering, I guess, that aerial assessment is gonna be able to actually help them cover more ground and identify trouble spots sooner. Um, Community Resource Center, uh, they're looking at making some modifications today to the models that were used last year and in that they're trying to take into consideration the fact that we have COVID reality and reduce uh, the potential for individuals to come within that six foot radius of one another um, and or providing things that really make sense to ensure that there is no impact either by staggering who's using it and when or what services are available um, at those community resource centers. And so um, there's some, some adjustments they're making there just in, in light of what we're dealing with right now. And then they've installed new high def cameras in a lot of the high fire threat areas. And so that's gonna help them get eyes on problems maybe a little bit sooner than they had been able to before, especially when uh, you consider the value of those cameras and how they've been able to identify things uh, in years past. You know. Long time ago, well before I became a firefighter, they had lookouts. And these fire lookouts would go and position themselves uh, in high towers uh, and, and look over vast areas of forest with binoculars, and they would just do their due diligence um, day in, day out, and identify situations that existed miles away. But these were the watchouts and the lookouts. These cameras are going to serve uh, in much the same manner. And so it's a um, again a very effective means of trying to get ahead of a problem. So with that, um, I just wanted to kind of summarize again the, the fact that there is a lot of work being done right now. Um, and I, I'm optimistic that as we move forward, the MWPA and the vegetation management efforts of staff will really start to yield some significant changes and or um, risk reduction in the Marinwood community moving forward. So if there's anything that anyone would like to ask about what I've just shared or any other part of my report, please feel free. Thank you, Chief. Anyone on the board have any questions for the Chief? Very thorough. That was a very thorough report. Bill? Very thorough. Okay. <laughs> it was awesome. Okay. Um, thank you again for the report. Um, any members of the public like to... Uh, Ask questions of the chief. Yeah, Jeff, one second. Yeah, Stephen, go ahead. Hi. Uh, chief, uh, thanks for the, the really good report. Um, I have a number of questions. Uh, I'll just start uh, with the COVID. Um, I know there's been a number of cases uh, in Marin, in the 949. 03 zip code, uh, uh, Terra Linda and Marinwood. And of course, just wondering if any of our first responders have been exposed to COVID and have they been, you know, furloughed or whatever, um, because we're, you know, we're calling on all these senior facilities where I assume most of these um, outbreaks have taken place. So that's number one. Um, Number two, I'm actually kind of surprised because of the weather that we haven't had a shutdown. Uh, last year we had hot weather, hot windy weather, and we, we've had that just this week. And actually uh, quite a number of times in this last 30 days. Um, 
glad that we don't have a blackout on top of COVID sh shelter in place, but um, I, I guess I'd like to get a feeling for whether or not we can expect that later on or they're going to maybe table the program until maybe next year. And then uh, lastly, uh, on the fire incidents page, um, you, the first instance that you had a Deer Valley vegetation fire that was out on Silvera Ranch. Now, I may be wrong. I've never heard of that area being referred to as Deer Valley. Um, but I actually, I called in that report um, uh, with other members of the public, and there was not a car there. So I, I don't know. This, this information appears completely wrong to me. Um, because it was right in the middle of the field. It looked like it was a spontaneous uh, combustion fire. So you may want to, you know, just correct your records if, it, uh, you know, maybe maybe you got incidents mixed up or something like that. But that did not, there was no car in that field. I, I can say that for certain. Um, so a couple questions uh, concerning COVID and uh, PG&E, and maybe you can also respond to uh, that vegetation fire, if you know anything more on that. Absolutely. I'll start with the latter first. Um, this information was provided to me by my staff, so I had assumed that they had very accurate information about who the reporting party was and what they may have witnessed and or what information came to the dispatch center to indicate uh, what may have been the cause and origin. And so with that, uh, I can't speak to why it's called Deer Valley. I'm assuming perhaps there's an exit nearby. Maybe that's what the arriving incident commander named the incident, because that's something that we do also. Um, we don't necessarily name an incident in the way people might expect. This could have been called Deer Valley Command. And so with that, I would ask for your knowledge, because you're obviously more knowledgeable than I am about where this is exactly located. Is there an exit? Is there a area over here that's known as Deer Valley Road or Deer Valley Way or Deer, Va uh, Deer Valley Street, as an example? Um, that would be Miller Creek Road exit, and that okay. is right in the middle of Severa Ranch, which is a well-known landmark. I mean, you know, it's not a big deal, but maybe for records, you, you'd want to get that straight. I don't know. Um, anyhow, so that's yeah. not a big deal. I just... We look into it and find out so that that way, um, as our incident commanders, you know, arrive on scene, they use good landmarks, good locations. Um, uh, again, you can name almost any incident, any kind of command you want. It's not as important to us that we be accurate about what the name of command is, more than it is that you're consistently using incident command and everybody understands where the incident is located and what's going on there. But it's certainly worth looking into, so I'll try to get an answer about that. As far as PG&E and their willingness to shelve the PSPS program, I think they feel like Last year, their operations were a success in reducing the number of potential incidents. So I can't see them wholeheartedly shelving the program. I think they're looking to scale back the use of, of as many PSPS um, shutdowns as they possibly can. But uh, only we can just cross our fingers and hope that somehow or another we're not impacted by the conditions that are ripe for another PSPS decision that's being made. And those, those things vary from wind conditions to humidity to um, weather reports, to um, conditions of uh, any number of historical references and markers that they use to identify the potential for an incident to take place in a specific location. And so that being said, when they combine all of those factors, they make a decision whether or not to trigger a PSPS. And they don't take it lightly from what I understand. They, they wanna make sure that they don't see a repeat of the campfires and the other incidents that have occurred across the state where there's been massive destruction and loss of life. So I would, uh, although I was not originally a big fan of PSPS, uh, I see and understand why they're doing it. I just, uh, I think the more effort they can put forward to reducing our risk and the, the sooner they can get out and inspect and reinspect lines, the faster they can actually put or reduce the impact of the PSPS. And that's one of the things that they actually claimed is that they're looking to actually scale back and get a PSPS event after the event dies down to make sure power is restored within 12 hours in our areas. That's one of their new targets. So we'll see if they're able to live up to it. And then as far as any COVID um, 
positive results. Not since my arrival, I believe, has there been any indication that any Marinwood staff have uh, tested positive. We have had our individuals respond on a number of positive individuals, but none of us, I think, have uh, tested positive, thankfully, and had to require um, isolation or anything else uh, at this point. I, I attribute that to um, good fortune. I attribute it to our efforts to uh, use practices and how many person now have to actually engage with someone that we consider suspected of potentially having it or confirmed of having it. I, I also attribute that to the processes we use, what, what we call a hot, warm, and cold zone when we go back to quarters and we start decontaminating after each call. I attribute that to the efforts to decontaminate and clean and disinfect stations and our apparatus and our equipment. I think those things that we're doing have really reduced our potential risk. And I think if you look at the number of incidents that are occurring in Marin County, we're one of the better counties uh, around in the way of total number of cases and or total number of fatalities that have occurred. And so that also translates into um, individuals adhering to the shelter in place order, washing their hands more, respecting social distances. So I, I'm, I think our, our fire departments have also contributed to that um, by being responsible as well. So as much as I have, Mr. Nestle. Thank you. Okay, um, Isabella, do you have a comment? Um, two items. I believe the Deer Valley name came from the name of the road that um, the vehicles probably used to access the fire. It is, um, it's coming from the Lucas Valley Road as opposed to Marinwood. So it's when you take Lucas Valley Road up north um, and then turn left, um, there is Deer Valley Road that, um, that might have provided access to the vehicles. Um, and um, what was the second one I wanted to? Oh, um, the COVID infections. Um, is that something that would be covered by HIPAA? or is that um, information that would be shared with um, everyone because of the public safety? I believe there's some exception to the HIPAA when it comes to first responders, making sure that they can be tested and uh, verified for possible exposure, whether it be uh, Ebola, whether it be COVID, whether it be um, any no number of communicable um, diseases. So I, I think, while we're looking at HIPAA and we're trying to ensure the public doesn't get information from what we write on our electronic patient care reports, as an example, there is something that we can do for first responders to confirm whether or not we've been exposed or potentially have at least uh, uh, been in proximity to someone who's a considered a PUI, person under investigation. Uh, and then oftentimes we're waiting to hear information and feedback. But I can tell you in my, my past life, sometimes we never hear back from from the hospital staff and we'd have to do a lot of follow-up with our infection control officer to try to get information um, but generally speaking uh, i think we've been very successful in trying to get information in this particular situation because people recognize that we could be individuals who could spread the COVID as well if we come in contact with someone and we haven't done our due diligence and continue to monitor our own staff for their well-being I think there's also part of the contact tracing is if somebody had tested positive at some point within two weeks of having been picked up by the fire department, right? Wouldn't the health department have to contact due to? They would, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I would hope that they would. But we're pretty good on our end of making sure we try to follow up with the hospital um, and the health department to ensure that we get some information about anyone we suspect or we may have gotten some form of confirmation that may have been exposed or may have tested positive. Very good. Any further questions from anybody on the board? Steve, thank you very much for your report and your responses. Thank you. Okay. We'll move on to item F3, next fire commission meeting, July 7th. I'm noting that it does not say tentative. So we're back on schedule for our commission. Yeah, they okay. met, uh, as you saw, obviously, at the beginning of the month, uh, which was an interesting process, uh, given the makeup of that uh, particular commission. Uh, but the intention is to uh, uh, continue meeting. Virtually. Very good. Okay. Yeah. 
All right, we'll move on to G, item G, park and rec matters. Thank you, um, Chief. Have a good, safe drive home. Thank you. Uh, take care now. Right. Thank you, Chief. You're welcome to stay. <laughs> I think I'm going to go have dinner. <laughs> All right. Item G1. Fiscal year 2020 2021 measure A work plan. Sure. Eric, yeah. Comment? Uh, so every year the district is required to submit a work plan to the uh, county uh, open space district, which uh, oversees uh, uh, the measure A funds. Um, it's actually not required that it goes through a board approval level. That's just an extra practice that we have done since inception. And I agree with continuing to do it. The, uh, uh, as you can see what I put in there, they're actually predicting uh, not predicting, they're, they're, they have an estimate for a potential of 25% loss in uh, total revenue to Measure A because Measure A is 100% funded through sales tax. And when you shut down 95% uh, of all sales tax revenue, uh, revenue generating sources, you get a hit. So you can see that rather than the closer to 90, they've moved it down to uh, 70,000 in this particular instance as an estimate for next year. And we'll just have to wait and see what winds up happening. Uh, as you can see right now, we have a, an approximate current balance of about 314,500. Adding the 70,000 to that would be around 384,500. Um, and the staff recommendation is to just continue with the primary uh, uh, capital expenditure project with the maintenance facility replacement uh, project and moving forward. Um, that said, should other items, amending the Measure A work plan to add other items is a very simple process um, throughout the course of the year should those funds be needed for something else but uh, we have been able up until this point to manage other needs utilizing money from our park budget and general fund. Okay. Thank you, Eric. Does anyone have any questions, anyone on the board have any questions for Eric regarding this Measure A work plan? No. Okay, I'm seeing none. Um, then I'll open it up to uh, the public. So, uh, you know, once again, basically all this money is going into Bill Hansel's dream project. Um, I, when we, we, the voters, voted for this. We voted to enhance our parks, uh, to uh, add more recreational uh, facilities like playgrounds for kids, um, restore wildlife. Um, make sure that seniors have stuff like park benches and none of this money has gone to that now I, I honestly I don't know what kind of Svengali control Bill Hansel has uh, upon the district but it apparently you know you're shamelessly putting it into this project when all we really need is a place for tools and some vehicles is a very simple structure like as is found in virtually every facility uh, in Marin and, and the state uh, no one goes for custom design features and showers and all that kind of stuff for a small district uh, and a small uh, park like our ours I think it's frankly an embarrassment um, I I know you're, you're, you've gone deep on this. Um, you don't want to talk about the budget, which it really scares me because it's, it seems to me that um, it's going to be more than our wildest, ima wildest imagination. And how you justify it, I honestly don't know. But be prepared to discuss this and other items and the relationships that you guys have because you know, this is our park. This is, you know, this bo park belongs to all of us. It belongs to future generations. And if we're not doing the right thing here, we're, we're really stealing from future generations as well as the community. Um, please, you know, 
utilize this fund, these funds as the way that they were intended. Uh, handicap access, we need more bathrooms, handicapped bathrooms in the, the district. We need the park benches, the safety features like the handrail that, that Linda uh, and I have been advocating for. And we need to restore um, these eroded trails. And uh, that's what the Measure A funds were intended for. You go back to the, the original uh, uh, language. Um, anyhow, you guys do what, you, what you're going to do, but uh, we're watching. Thank you, Stephen. Okay. Uh, hey, I'm sorry, Jeff. Uh, if you don't mind, if I if I could, uh, to be clear and put it out there, um, since the inception of my Measure A fund, some of the projects that it has funded has included a new flooring for the reception hall, as well as a new storage area besides the community center. It installed HVAC into areas of the of the community center that didn't currently exist. It has applied repairs to uh, tennis courts, including new top coat resurfacing, several pool equipment uh, repairs and equipment additions to that as well. Uh, it's taken care of wood trim uh, and other outside maintenance needs of, of the community center. It has also purchased uh, a couple of park vehicles, one being the maintenance truck, one being the smaller uh, utility vehicle, the Kawasaki Mule. Um, and it's again touched every tennis court uh, up and down uh, that we own uh, in terms of that. So it, the, the money has certainly gone to a lot of the uh, other improvements and not just a sole project. Thank you, Eric. That's good, good information to share. If there are no other questions from the board to the public, I'd like a motion to approve the fiscal year 2020-2021 Measure A work plan. So moved. Leah? And? I'll second. Sivan. Tiffany? Board President Naylor? Aye. Director Green? Aye. Director Oyserman? Aye. Director Perry? Aye. And Director Shea? Aye. Thanks. Thank you. Okay, we'll move to item G2, PNR maintenance report. Luke. Thank you, Jeff. Um, okay. Thank you, everyone. Uh, so the uh, main theme for the for this last month, and especially this last couple of weeks, has been gearing up for our summer camps. As Eric mentioned, and thanks for the kind words, Eric. Um, our sort of green light to move forward with running summer camps came on May 22nd and every minute since then um, the recreation staff has just been hustling to get this program up and running uh, and doing you know a few plus months of preparation in a couple weeks and it's um, it's been a, a, a whirlwind to say the least. Uh, thankfully we did uh, expect a lot of what was in the health order um, allowing us to run camps and we predicted uh, fairly accurately so uh, we didn't have to necessarily change what our expectations were but um, we just had to start getting everything in place and um, starting to finalize how we were going to run our summer program in accordance with the, the health guidelines which has been um, a very very uh, big challenge to say the least but um, I've been uh, very impressed with how the staff has adapted and adjusted and, and hustled and, and you would be very surprised with some of the hours that uh, people have been working uh, this last uh, couple weeks to um, get everything in place to be able to do this. Some of the major changes that I highlighted in the report um, that are going to occur to our camps this summer, um, one being a, is a big reduction in our enrollment. Um, we are forced to run camps of no more than 12 participants. And um, normally, uh, most of our summer camp groups would have around 40 to 42. So that's um, a big reduction in what we're allowed to, um, or what we're, what we're able to offer. Um, the camp groups cannot mix. We can't have the same groups in the same room or the same facility at the same time. Um, we can't have staff uh, move from one group to another group one day to another. Um, there has to be a, a, they call them stable groups, and the sessions now have to be 
uh, three weeks long instead of one week. So we have to have the same group of kids with the same dedicated staff, um, not mixing at all for um, three weeks at a time, which is a, which is a big change for us and for all the parents and um, families that, that we normally serve. So that's been a, been a big adjustment. Um, and there's a lot of extra cleaning and sanitizing uh, that goes on anytime that a group uses a facility that's going to be used by um, another group at another time. Um, we have to clean and sanitize everything that's been touched and um, just a lot of hand washing, hand sanitizing, uh, cleaning of equipment and, and materials and supplies uh, throughout the day. Um, so. It's uh, something that we, we were planning ahead for just in case. And so um, we, we did have a head start, I think, compared to some other agencies. I'm really happy about that. But um, it's been a lot of planning and sort of starting from scratch in some ways with um, how, how to run our program uh, the best way we can and provide sort of that Marinwood um, summer magic with these kind of these confines. So that's been um, a, big, a big thing that we've been dealing with this last few weeks. Um, and part of that is the logistics of transferring the hundreds of, of kids signed up for, for normal camp that we were expecting to run back in February um, into this, this new program. And uh, there's, there's been just a lot of um, uh, unprecedented uh, logistical nightmares with, uh, with refunds and transfers and, and uh, how to go about it. And our system has not quite cooperated with with that process the way we were hoping but um, thanks to Carolyn uh, for um, leading the charge on on the on the background and the logistics for all that and uh, putting a lot of hours and a lot of phone calls with our software company and um, just a lot of brainstorming and how are we going to make this puzzle kind of fit together and we're thankfully um, less than a week away we're, we're finally there and, and we're feeling really good about um, starting camp on Monday so our first session will start this coming Monday on the 15th, our camps are full. Um, we're running um, all the same camp groups that we would normally run, uh, just with the, with the limited enrollment, which also comes with a limited um, amount of staffing to, to run those, those groups of 12. And we will be making full use of our facilities. The camps do thankfully get to use the pool, um, but only one group at a time. So um, making that schedule was, was uh, incredibly challenging as well. And, um, uh, and we, in order to get some more room time when we can't have multiple groups in a room at a time, uh, it's been very limiting. We were able to uh, pursue an agreement with the school district to allow us um, a greater use of Miller Creek Middle School. And uh, thanks to Eric for helping uh, establish that conversation. And the school district has been very generous with us or to us and um, allowed us to, to get five um, good classrooms along with the use of the gym, bathrooms, blacktop and field. And that's gonna allow us to give all of our camps some indoor space in a, in a very significant way and get some break from the sun. And um, it'll, it'll be very helpful for us, especially with the, with the bathroom use. So we're very grateful that the school is, has come through for us and that's gonna allow us to um, spread out uh, a little bit more this summer um, and meet all of our, our guidelines. Um, so that's been uh, a, a big challenge, but we've, we've kind of made it over the hump and I'm, I'm very pleased with where we're at right now in, in preparation for that. And we're um, on board to, to have everything start up on, on Monday morning. So that should be exciting. A um, couple other uh, changes that we've uh, gone through. We're not going to be doing any field trips. We're not going to be able to bring in outside entertainment. And uh, we had to cancel our overnight adventure uh, that we send a lot of kids on every year. Um, but thankfully, we have an amazing set of grounds and, and property to use, and, and we'll be spreading out and, and being very creative in how we uh, keep things interesting and exciting and creative for the for the camps this summer. Um, oh, and one thing just to note, and I'm, I'm sure most of you are aware, we uh, in making a reduction of a, I think around between sixty and seventy percent of the participants that we normally have, um, and everyone's circumstances changing and us changing from one week sessions to three week sessions. It was uh, pretty challenging to figure out how do we determine who gets to be uh, in camp this summer. And uh, we ended up uh, to, to be fair, just went to a, a random drawing, um, which we started with, with residents that had been signed up previously and then to um, non-residents that had been previously signed up for camp. And um, 
we're finally able to uh, get the camps filled up uh, doing that. And <laughs> that turned out to be um, a, a very uh, long and drawn out process. And we would um, never do that again, but it, it worked out. And um, after a lot of parents changing minds and a lot of inner back and forth, I think Carolyn's averaging, I wrote it in here, um, some ridiculous amount of emails a week uh, this last couple of weeks. Um, we uh, finally, uh, yeah, 2,000 emails last week uh, when I wrote this report out. It's uh, just uh, a lot of back and forth. We definitely think it's different next time, but we made it happen, and, and we'll, I think we're finally able to, um, we're able to accommodate 164 uh, kids a week, which I think Robin tallied up for me today that we're serving, um, I think, th around 320 unique campers this summer. So um, we will probably be the largest child care program in Marin County uh, this summer, and we're very I'm happy that we have the staff and the facilities and the resources to be able to provide that many of our local families with child care. So um, happy to work. That's over the three that. sessions. Sorry. Oh uh, yes, for the whole yeah throughout the whole <laughs> summer. That that's how many individual kids will be able to to come to camp this summer. Um, and I know a lot of places are offering much a much smaller uh, um, program just because of all the limitations on room use and and uh, staffing and everything. So. I'm very pleased that we're, that we're able to offer that program this summer and we'll, um, we'll see how it goes. Uh, for the pool, just to speak a little bit about that, uh, Eric mentioned briefly that we were able to, uh, we got some guidelines allowing for uh, pool use in some capacity that came out on Friday. And like he said, we haven't had a chance to um, explore that fully to see what we're able to make happen. Uh, as of right now, the camps are allowed to use the pool. Um, in very with very limited uh, use of so one group at a time and, and we're excited to be able to do that um, and we will be looking at uh, what else we're able to accommodate this season um, once we kind of get camp up and running next week uh, staff will sit down and strategize to see what, what's going to make sense what's feasible what's affordable for um, opening the pool for um, you know beyond camp use um, so there are a lot of restrictions with using the pool in terms of um, how staff are able to perform the necessary rescues and uh, if there is an emergency, how they are able to, to limit contact and stay safe. And um, a lot of guidelines have come down through various agencies and um, Stephanie and I have been looking through those and we'll be training, training the lifeguard staff this weekend with some updated uh, protocols to um, be able to provides a safe environment at the pool and respond to emergencies, but also keep our staff and our patrons as safe as possible during this, um, this COVID-19 situation. So that's been uh, challenging, but a lot of resources have come, come through the, the local aquatics community that, that we're looking at. And so we'll, we should be all ready to go um, by Monday for, for pool use. And we'll be looking at what we can do beyond that in the coming uh, days and weeks. Um, we've got some other programs we'll be unleashing after we get camp up and running, some uh, uh, things for families that are still sheltering at home to be able to do to engage with um, our open space and trails and some other um, scavenger hunts and fun things that we'll, um, we'll be releasing uh, online that, that we'll be announcing in the coming weeks and we're excited about that. Uh, before I move on to uh, the parks uh, maintenance section of, of my report, is there any discussion about um, recreation questions. Yeah, I just thank wanna... you for the uh, teasers about possibly adding some programs to the pool. You got me on tenor hooks at this point. Well, hopefully, uh, hopefully uh, that's, that, that was the right teaser to, to, to tease out there. <laughs> I'll look forward to uh, further information when you can supply it. Very good. And I, I just wanted to say thank you to you and to Robin and to Carolyn and to Stephanie and to Tiffany and of course, Eric. It's been insane and everything's changing minute by minute. And the fact that you guys got this going and we'll see how well things work, but I'm amazed and I applaud you guys. Thank you for all the hard work. I know that there were some days that were beginning it had less work and now it's piling on, but thank you. Yeah, thanks for saying that. Especially when we're all trying to do it with kids at home. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> uh, I appreciate that. Um, no, it's been, it's been uh, great. The, the staff have been absolutely fantastic um, during this process. I'm very grateful to have such a good crew 
that is seasoned and willing to put the time in to, um, to make this happen. It was uh, definitely a new and unprecedented challenge, but um, uh, it was, yeah, we made it happen. So um, on the parks maintenance side of things, uh, the crew has been getting things ready for camp, um, doing some turf treatment, getting the pool uh, up and running after sitting dormant for um, a few couple months. And so there's been a lot of cleanup around the facility and a lot of preparation for the the, the kids that will be showing up on Monday and the families. Um, we've had a few years this this last month. One major one just um, we're working on this. Uh, uh, was last week a Broadwater main down on the far field, um, and uh, we've had a lot of. I don't know if you guys have been tracking this, but it seems like a lot of uh, leaks and 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 pipe repairs recently, and it seems that uh, a lot of these pipes and um, connections were established back in 1987, I think we were tracking today. And um, I think the, a lot of things are at their usable lifespan and we're starting to see some things start to crack and leak and we've just had repair after repair after repair. But thankfully the, the crew has uh, gotten very good at, at that and we've just been solving them a day at a time. So um, it's, been, it's been good to get those things wrapped up. We've had a lot of that to deal with this last, uh, this last spring. Um, one kind of exciting project we ended up with this a uh, couple of weeks ago was um, a, we took down a large um, tree house that had been constructed in the open space that uh, was proving to be a, a liability for the district and um, it's sort of sad to have to, to see it go but we went out there with one of our um, tree contractors that we use a lot and, and dismantled and took that down and had to haul out um, a lot of lumber and uh, that was a fun project in some ways, but also um, felt, you know, felt a little bit bad uh, taking that down. And we also removed a tree near the playground that was diseased and rotting out from um, the inside. And uh, um, so that was another um, project we used that same tree service for that same day. Um, upcoming projects just include some repairs in the kitchen and classroom. Um, we have, uh, we've got some signage that we're putting up in the um, open space with all the trail use that's going on. Um, there's been a lot more traffic, a lot more bike traffic and foot traffic, and we um, have uh, printed out some, has some signage made to help uh, people know where, what trails are for bikes only, what trails are for foot traffic, and we'll be um, trying to kind of educate the, the hiking and biking public a little bit better now that we have some of these connections from the new um, trail out there and all the increased traffic will be hopefully giving people a little bit better indications of where they should be and where they can be and we'll be working on that in the coming weeks as well um, and uh, and then just trying to keep up with the demands of um, maintenance around the facility as uh, as we have a lot of kids and families out here this summer um, thank you yeah any questions thank you so the piping material that um, we continue to have leaks is this like PVC piping or yeah, it's PVC pipe. Um, a lot of uh, just uh, collars that connect different uh, sections of pipe. They're just that's sort of a, a weak spot that um, they wear out over time, and they're they're all very kind of obvious spots where the where the leaks happen, and they've been pretty fairly small leaks. But um, yeah, just replacing the collars. It's been pretty straightforward. I see. Okay, fair enough. Are the playgrounds mm -hmm. open again? Uh, as of right now, the playgrounds are closed uh, until further notice um, due to the, the high touch uh, yeah. common, you know, area that they have not released any guidelines allowing for playground use. Um, I have not received an indication of where that is on the list or how, how long That's it will fine. be. But. Just a heads up, as of yesterday, the sign that was connecting the two baby swings in the mini park was clipped down. Gotcha. Yeah, we'll have to, uh, thank you. Um, we'll be uh, having to kind of keep- I haven't been on there. our main area, so I can't tell you anything about that, but we rode by and I did a visual inspection as we rode and- I appreciate Trying to ignore um, the groaning of my child who felt like physical activity should not be occurring, so. <laughs> right, and it was, uh, I'm surprised those were actually <laughs> stayed up as long as they did, but uh, yeah, we'll have to be kind of keep enforcement. Um, people have been fairly good about staying off the playground uh, from, from what we were able to witness day to day. But um, I'm, I'm sure there's been a little bit of activity out there. Yeah. Okay. Yes, the red pail moved last week. Okay. <laughs> Thank you, Jeff. Okay, no problem. Did it move a foot or just a couple? <laughs> no, clear across the. <laughs> <clears throat> All right. 
They it, it, was, any, it, it was pretty yeah. windy last week, I'm just saying. So <laughs> That's so, true. Yeah, I didn't do any fingerprinting or anything, but that's possible. Okay. Does anyone else have any uh, questions or comments for Luke? Okay, I'll open up mem members of the public. Questions and comments in both sections of Luke's report. I'll start with uh, uh, the first. Uh, you know, congratulations to Luke. I know I've known Luke for a number of years, and I know he's very creative in his uh, in his skills. And I'm sure he's going to do a great job this summer along with his staff. So, real excited about that. And uh, I guess we'll we'll see. Um, I was actually surprised that uh, we're going to be doing summer camps, uh, given the fact that a lot of businesses are still shut down. Um, but right now, with the health orders the way they are, they, they don't make any sense to me. But I was a little anxious um, about the, uh, the sanitation. Um, I, I just think it's a big challenge uh, to begin with. Uh, I guess we're going to have, what, about 200 kids um, in the facilities, Luke? Or, or during at, at one time, as opposed to 500. Um, not not quite. Uh, altogether, there'll be about uh, 160 kids uh, on the grounds, but they will not be all utilizing uh, the facilities. So we won't see all those kids going through the community center. Um, we will not see all those kids in the same spot or utilizing the same aspects of our facility. They'll be very um, kind of take, keeping to their to their own spots for for most of the three week period that they're that they're. So, so I understand kids aren't, you know, depending on what, which health report you want to see, but I, the indication is that kids are not, you know, really affected by this disease, which is, which is really wonderful. And the fact that you're spreading them out uh, between Miller Creek and, and uh, our community center, that's great too. Um, but, you know, one, I'm kind of curious because we don't have that many bathroom facilities at the, at the, Marinwood, um, uh, you know, center, community center, you know, how do you, how do you manage stuff like keeping like the, the toilet area clean? Is there a new protocol that's uh, required? Can you just, I guess in general, what I'd like to hear is what this, what the, the, the health protocols are. Is staff going to be wearing masks all day? Is that only going to be occasional or maybe it's not necessary? I, you know, then as far as the sanitation, how does that work? And then if after you answer that, I have some more questions concerning the, uh, some other things. Um, yeah, no, that's a, that's a great question, Stephen. And um, yes, there are some very specific guidelines laid out for all of that. Uh, for uh, facilities that do need to be shared by, by uh, campers and staff, such as restrooms, where we don't have one restroom per camper um, or even per group, uh, there are protocols for one group at a time. We'll be using the restroom. Um, the, the common touch areas such as handles and door handles and sink handles and um, et cetera will be um, sprayed and wiped down uh, after use before another group goes in. Um, staff will be uh, wearing uh, masks uh, throughout, throughout the day um, and we do have a specific uh, set of protocols for sanitizing equipment facilities um, after, before and after each use. Um, especially if there's going to be a, uh, a different group coming through that, that area. We leave time um, between for, for sanitation and, and uh, for cleaning between everything. And it's very, it's very laid out and very specific. We'll be following all of the um, Health and Human Services Department's guidelines for um, how we approach our facilities and, and how to sanitize um, between groups. Okay, that, that makes a lot of sense. So basically, you're not wiping down a toilet after every kid uses it, but the 12, basically the, the 12 germs, germ uh, uh, collectors stay together and uh, you, you basically you're, you're taking care of your group and that's, that makes sense to me. Um, okay, as far as the pool goes, uh, I'm also excited about the potential of swimming in the pool, but I'm actually not gonna hold my breath uh, on that. But if, if you can work it out, I, I'll be interested in that. And I'm sure many of us lap swimmers will, will 
also want to uh, know about a program, even if it's you know a couple hours a day. You know that that would be just fantastic. Um, now, as far as your staff is concerned, back down to the parks and maintenance, are you is your staff? 100% on duty now, um, you know, during the normal hours, or are they still taking day turns coming into work? Um, due to the nature of what we have to prepare for and all the, the work at hand, uh, we have uh, staff is working normal um, schedule uh, as of right now. Uh, the last, um, last, last couple to few weeks to double check. All right. So, um, as far as, uh, okay. So, and I noticed, notice you've taken down some more trees and I don't know, there are a couple things. Um, they are protected trees that you're taking down as you know, I know that, that you say that they're diseased, I guess. I don't know how you're determining that, but, um, I, I know the, these are protected trees and they're coming down within the stream conservation area. Also, uh, as you're aware, I don't think you got back to her. Uh, Linda talked to me, I guess one of your staff was driving the gator uh, through the creek, which is like horrendous. So I, I don't know, I'm really disappointed that there's no, you know, le not that much environmental awareness on your staff on how to treat open space versus park space. It really needs to be treated with care. The reason why we have so much erosion in the park is not because of the public. It's because of the parks department driving heavy vehicles on it in, in the wrong places. And so, um, you know, as much as I like you guys, I really, I, I get furious that you guys do not take the simple care that is needed to, you know, make that open space look good and stay in a natural set, uh, uh, stay in a natural setting. Also, um, you know, the uh, you're, once again, I mean, I, I said this to Eric. I'll say it to you. I mean, you're 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 basically. Uh, taking care of the center, you're taking care of the camps, you're taking care of a few things, but the open space, that's that huge unused um, asset that we have in our community and many of us really love it and enjoy it and um, I really would like to see a more focused effort on open space, on recreation opportunities, on areas other than camp and your, your, your adult education programs at the center. So um, with that, I'll, I'll let you go. Thank you, Stephen. Any other questions or comments for Luke? Luke, thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, moving to H2, next PNR commission meeting, June 23rd. It's coming up. Okay, we'll move to um, item H, board member items of interest, request for future agenda items. Does anyone from the board have anything to uh, request? Maybe an update on how the first session of camps went which you're gonna give us anyway, so there's no real point in asking for it, but I'm stating it. Very good, thank you. Anyone else? Okay, I have something uh, I hope will go fairly briefly. Um, and I recognize that I am one member of this board. I am not trying to dictate anything, but while we generally refrain from discussing matters that are outside the subject matter jurisdiction of this um, this district, I believe current events warrant an exception. The most recent killings of six black men at the hands of police after so many like events over the years have ignited demands for justice for black people in our state, our nation and beyond. In our district, which is predominantly white, many people participated in protests 
and use common nonviolent means of protest and issue recognition by drawing slogans in chalk, including Black Lives Matter, which is the central theme and focus on local sidewalks to express their support. One such, one such action by a number of our citizens was met with a tirade of verbal abuse, which has been well publicized. After that incident, I was encouraged to see that many more members of our district and wider community came together to demonstrate what I believe is a more current and prevalent community attitude of support for black people everywhere. As a I have long imagined myself in situations that are foreign to me, but very real for black people throughout our country, and I support the efforts to correct these wrongs. What I'd like to um, recommend, what, or what I'd like to ask of our staff, as time permits during the current pandemic, if we, um, if they could create a statement of support for this crucial effort and present it for the board to consider if we want to um, adopt a statement of support that will reflect the majority of our community, provoke reflection to others, and can be adopted by our board. And that's all I have. Anybody want to comment? I support that. Okay, if, does anyone have any other items of interest? or future agenda items. Okay, I'll open it up to the public. Stephen. A um, couple, couple things. First of all, uh, thanks, Jeff, for your concern of uh, uh, black, the, the protest. I think it was great that people got out and expressed their frustration. However, uh, that actually turned into a pretty ugly incident. First with the, the gentleman, um, I don't know, his name's all over Facebook and next door from what I understand. Um, he, he acted completely inappropriately. However, he was terrorized and I, 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 I gotta say, I, it, it shook me uh, to see basically what I consider a mob go after him. He, uh, from what I understand, there were people outside his, his condo uh, demanding that he come out of his house. And uh, just imagine, you know, being that person. I guess, you know, I have no, no problem um, supporting, uh, uh, you know, I, I was horrified as anyone with the, the death of uh, Mr. Floyd. But, um, you know, the subsequent events, the rioting, the looting, and what I think is just absolutely barbaric behavior and pe pe from people in the name of justice really doesn't deserve our support. Uh, I, I, I don't want to go far as to censor it, but, but, but just to say that, you know, we are an inclusive community, I think, is adequate and that we shouldn't really try to, you know, weigh in on this one particular issue it's just it's just really not in our bailiwick i mean people i i don't think anyone w was against uh, mr floyd but but there is quite a bit of uh uh different feelings as far as what transpired you know during the rioting and looting so i i you know you know please if you're gonna put out a statement make sure it's uh, inclusive and, and really doesn't, you know, maybe speaking to, to Mr. Floyd, but to, to, to go any larger than that, I think is going to create maybe a little bit of ill feeling in the community. I understand. Thank you, Stephen. Um, Sivan? I would like to clarify that most of the people have been documented, the ones that were doing the looting, weren't actually people that have been out protesting for Black Lives Matter and that those were instigators who came in. Um, and I greatly urge our district to stand up and say the right thing, even if it does make our community slightly uncomfortable, because this is the point at which we need to discuss it, especially 
since we are a mostly white community, who does have some of our community who is feeling this in a day-to-day -day where they are not just slightly uncomfortable, but extremely uncomfortable, un feeling unwelcomed and unwanted. So I support Jeff in his request for a statement, and I hope that it is as strongly worded as we can go. Thank you, Savon. Any other comments? Okay, hearing none, our favorite topic, motion to adjourn. Do I have a motion? A motion to Bill. adjourn. Bill held up his hand. Could be so moved. So moved. say that too. And who, who seconded? I'll second. Sivan will second. Sivan will second. Okay. Sure. Tiffany? Finally, Board President Naylor. <laughs> Aye. <laughs> Director Green. Aye. Director Oysterman. Aye. Sorry, I, I muted myself. <laughs> That's okay. <laughs> Director Perry. Aye. And Director Shea. Aye. I guess that was unanimous too. Yeah, I just I wanted to close by saying, Leah, I thought you you provided some really interesting changes in background <laughs> during the meeting. That was very entertaining. Thank you. That was that was the backyard. It's really hot upstairs <laughs> here. <laughs> well, so much for the second Zoom meeting. Thank you all for your attendance. Um, very much appreciated. I hope we'll all talk soon. Good night, Thank Al. you, everybody. Be safe, everyone. Be safe. Good night. Good night. Thanks.